Good morning. Happy Sabbath. So today is June 26 and it is 5.29 a.m. here in New Brunswick, Canada. And my name is Sharon Phillips and I would like to give some encouragement to those who are seeking to take the step into country living. So before we begin, I'm just going to pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, dear God, we thank you so much for another beautiful Sabbath morning. We thank you that we're alive and well, and I pray, Father, that I will not be seen, I will not be heard, but instead, only you and what you would want these hearers to hear. Fill us, dear Lord, with your Holy Spirit. Put your words in my mouth and keep my thoughts focused only upon you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. So this could be a very long testimony or it could be short. So I want to make it as succinct as possible. To begin, I have three verses and at the end, I'll also have three verses and I also have a quote. So I'll first begin with the quote. It says, unfortunately, I don't have the reference for the quote. It's from E.G. White, and it says, Those who decide to do nothing in any line that will displease God will know, after presenting their case before him, just what course to pursue, and they will receive not only wisdom, but strength, power for obedience, for service, will be imparted to them as Christ has promised. Now, the verses I'm going to share are ones that I believe everyone knows. So the first is Philippians 4.19. Just want to make sure I quote it properly. So Philippians 4, verse 19 says, <clears throat> but God, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And then Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. And our last verse is Isaiah 54.5-6. For thy maker is thine husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. The God of the whole earth shall he be called. For the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, and a wife of youth when thou wast refused, saith thy God. Now those three verses were verses that helped me as I was seeking to move into the country. Strength, we all need strength. I had no means, so I needed God to supply and I'm also, I don't have a husband, so I needed that husband. Let's go from, let's back up a little. So originally I'm from Jamaica. I'm not from Canada. And where I lived in Jamaica wasn't necessarily country, but it was rural. So I had lots of trees. I had birds singing, if you threw some seeds outside, you go back outside, you see something growing. That's what I grew up with, and that's what, as I got older in Jamaica, we moved to. So even though I worked in the city, once I reached a certain point, it's called Manor Park, I could turn off the AC in my car, wind down the windows, and there was a total difference. So when I came to Canada, and I heard the country living message because I didn't hear it in Jamaica. I heard it here in Canada. It was not something that I saw as a privation. It wasn't something that I thought would be excessively hard, but it was something that I was very interested in, especially having children because the counsel that is given to us in the book Country Living is geared more for individuals with small children to keep them from the effects of living in the city, the draws of the sight, the smells and the sound. So 
I heard about the country living message really intensely in 2011 when I had um, my second son, Shalom. And I was very interested, but at the time, so many things were happening. You know, you were hearing all of this. Moses Mason was making his rounds and so many other things are going on. So I wasn't able to really pursue that. 2014, I had my third son, and I really, really wanted that experience because by this time, it was, you know, you were, I was looking at Shalom and I was seeing that, okay, he's going to be going into school. School in Canada is different than school in Jamaica. I have an older son who was born in Jamaica. He went to school in Jamaica, and yes, Jamaica has many things that are not the very best, but we still had morning prayers in school. You still had religious education in school. You still had teachers there who were very low-key, modest, thinking about God. Some form of religious instruction would fall upon that child, in a sense. But here, everything was supposed to be as liberal as possible, very little conservative views. So I was not eager for him to go into a public school here. So at that point, we were hoping to go to the country. We ended up going to a small town called Elliot Lake in Ontario. And it was a little less than what you would have gotten in the big city. You didn't have the big stores, so you weren't seeing the, the half-naked models in the windows and stuff. So it was good. We had uh, we were in a house instead of an apartment. There was a little backyard so the kids could run around, could do a little gardening. So that was all good and well. Things happened that made a whole lot of difference in our lives. Separations happened and it came to the point where we really needed to submit make changes or I needed to submit, I needed to make changes in my experience with God. So that was 2016 and fast forward to 2018. So between 2016 and 2018, I had moved from Elliott Lake to Saskatchewan and now 2018, I'm back in Ontario. Now, this is me and just the two boys, just the two of us together, the three of us, I should say, together. And we're living in a little apartment, which was a testimony. So I'll give that testimony before I get to the main testimony. <clears throat> so we moved from Saskatchewan because things were not working out with their dad and we decided to separate and we were back in Ontario. When we came to Ontario, we drove in that morning. Unfortunately, it was a Sabbath morning to a hotel at two in the morning, having driven from Manitoba. So I was so tired, so tired out. I felt like I was about to die. We get into this hotel, had to literally, you know, pound on the door for the attendant to get up to let us in. Go and take a nap. We had no clue as to where we would go. Not one. We had no clue. Because we only had the hotel booked for the two days, which was booked on points on my credit card. And we had no money as to, you know, renting anything, really. We had no money. And something said to me when I got up that morning, that Sabbath morning, there was a gentleman who we had spoken to and we were in Saskatchewan about renting his place. And an acquaintance of ours was supposed to look at the place on our behalf, but it did not work out because the gentleman who owned the place had gone to a funeral that day when he came. So this was like three weeks. You know, generally an apartment that goes fast. We called the gentleman. He said, no, the apartment is still available. So the option was that if we had waited where we were, we more than likely would have ended up in a big city because we were in a small city called Orangeville, 
And if we had waited for their dad to try and find a place for us to go, we would have ended up in Brampton, Ontario. And Brampton is a big city, a very big city with everything that if you are seeking to live a more low-key, spiritually filled life, you're going to be distracted. So we drive there, myself and the two boys, because their dad had to go do his thing. And when we got there, the man was saying, well, you know, I'd like to rent you guys a place, but usually we aren't able to do that, you know, on a Saturday because of all the things that you have to do. You have to transfer the electricity in your name. You have to get a credit check done. Da, 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 da. Well, in 15 minutes, it was transferred in my name. The credit check was done on their dad. Their dad was able to email the money to pay the rent, and we had an apartment. That apartment happened to be just five minutes walk from the Adventist church, a small Adventist church in the city of Shelburne, which again is a part of the testimony, the great testimony. So we go to this church in Shelburne the following week, and we meet a young lady there whose name I won't give. And when I was in Saskatchewan, I was on Facebook on a country living group, and I saw this video for, or not a video, a little um, brochure that was uh, talking about a country living camp in Madoc, Ontario. And I was like, oh, I wish we were in Ontario because we could go to that camp and learn some more about what country living really is supposed to be. But, you know, I'm not driving from Saskatchewan three days to get to Madoc. So we never went that year. When we go to Shelburne, I happened to be talking to this young lady and I mentioned the camp and said, you know, I'd love to go to that camp because I really want to move into the country. Because Shelburne is a small town, but it wasn't country. We're still in an apartment. People, you're still seeing lots of sites. And the woman just happens to mention that the person who runs the camp is her sister. Which the following week just happens to come to church. Which I was like, whoa, God is so good. Because now I actually am more likely to go. Because I know the people who have put on the camp. And I'm acquainted with one of the persons personally because they attend the church academy. So that year, that was 2019, the fast forwarding now to 2019 summer, we go to the camp. It was a wonderful camp. They had a wonderful speaker, Elvin Bridges. I really love his ministry. It's all about country living, very practical. Lots of videos on his site, Living Man and Ministry, something you could look into. And we went and we listened and we listened and the more we listened, my heart was burning inside and I was like, I need to be in the country. So we're there 2019, listening to all of these, you know, wonderful testimonies of other people who have made it into the country. We're listening to the real purpose of country living. It isn't about hiding. It's about spiritual growth, evangelizing, helping others and everything. And I'm like, yeah, that's what we should be doing. That's what we need to be doing. That's where we need to go. So now the camp ends, wonderful camp. You know, it ends as all good things do. And we go back home. And I say to the Lord, Lord, you brought me here. You brought me to this particular church. You brought me to this particular place. And now I'm asking you, please help us. How do we get to, 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 to into the country? So we were looking, looking, looking. There was an opportunity came up where a group of Adventists wanted to buy a property and split it. So we go, we look at the property and I'm like, yeah, it looks good. You know, they're talking about how people work together and, you know, improve on the land and build up homes and all of that. But we didn't have the means. We really didn't have the means. So it did not work out for us. So again, I am speaking to the lady who did the Maydog camp and she's like, hey, why don't you go to New Brunswick? A lot of people are moving to New Brunswick because the home prices there are very cheap. Well, New Brunswick is, the prices of the homes are cheap because the opportunities down here are very limited. You don't really have many job opportunities down here. The population down in New Brunswick 
I say down because moving down from Ontario, it is um, basically the opportunities are not that big for, you know, jobs like, you know, even being creative and developing your own business may be a challenge, but it's something to investigate and trust a lot for. So I started looking at properties down here and I was like, oh, wow, you know, you can get a, a little house for like $30,000 with an acre of land. And I was like, wow, in Ontario, you ain't getting anything for $30,000. You're not even getting a shoebox. And I was looking and I was looking and looking, but even $30,000 for me was like $3 million. I didn't have it. I honestly didn't have it. So we looked through 2019. She introduced us to a gentleman down here and we were speaking back and forth with him. And then, you know, he saw something and he's like, oh, if you're interested, you could look at this and you could come down and stay with a friend of a friend of his, a lady and her family and see the, the, the area. Um, things happened which prevented us from coming down that year, 2019. So I had to pass on 2019. So 2020 comes and I get up January 1st and I was like, God, this has to be the year where you take us into the country because we're living in an apartment. The kids upstairs are always running. The machine is always running. There's no real quiet, no peace. You can't hear yourself think half the time. Then coronavirus hits. Now there's a greater challenge. Before I could walk to to the park with the kids and they could get some free space and run around and now everybody's masked and everybody's afraid don't touch this don't touch that no don't even look at it so we're there and i'm like lord i really really want to leave i really really want to leave so again i'm looking around i'm you know asking the lord what should i do what should i do i'm praying i'm begging the lord give us a country home give us a country home please you know for the children's sake, you're the one who says that they should be in the country. And I'm praying, constantly asking him. And I remember someone offered to assist us in getting a mortgage. So there was a property we saw in um, Moncton. It was Moncton or Mermache. That's also in New Brunswick. And it was a nice property, but it was like $60,000. People hearing these figures, listening to this video, are like, $60,000, seriously, that's not a lot. But again, for me, that's a lot. And I was looking at it, and the person said, sure, I'll help you. So I spoke to the real estate agent, made an offer on it. In like 15 minutes, he comes back and says, somebody else has made an offer, but that offer may fall through. So, um, we'll keep it on the books. I said, okay. Five minutes after that, the person who says that they're going to help us comes back with this long litany of stuff. And I decided, you know what? It's best not to go that route. So I told them, thanks for the help, you know, the offer for help, but we'll just pass on that this time. So that was May of 2020. So I was very distraught. I was very, I was like, God, it's like all the doors are being closed. There is no help coming. So July comes around and more properties here become available. Because, you know, summer months, people are more up for sale. And we start seeing more things in the $20,000, $30,000 range going down. And, you know, looked at a couple of them and made an offer on a couple of them. Because for me to make an offer... Just to give you an idea, I had two lines of credits. I had two, three line of credits amounting to $23,000. I had maybe 1500 saved. So for me to think of anything, it has to be within like the 20000 region with, you know, the estimation of about $3,000 for closing costs. So I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking, and I'm like, you know, you know, they say you can always bid lower and see if it works. So we see a couple of properties, we bid on it, and somebody else outbids us. So finally, we find this one property 
where it has two acres, very nice little thing, but it's, as I said, a little thing, it's literally 300 square feet. And I'm thinking, okay, we could take it. It has a bathroom, it has a little kitchenette, and then we'll just add on a room every year or however long we're there, we add something onto it. It's just me and the two little kids. We can make it work. So we start speaking with the gentleman. The gentleman was not as eager to sell to us because one, I'm a single woman with two kids and he's like, well, if you come down here, I'm going to be a resource person. Everything you need, you're going to run to me. And I would expect that because I have a daughter and I wouldn't want my daughter to be in this unknown by herself. So he gives me this long talk, you know, this father talk where he talks to me about the weather, what to expect with the snow, you know, the things that may crop up that I may not have thought of, you know. It was a very good talk. The man was not mean-spirited or anything. And then he says, you know, my real desire is to sell it to somebody who, after that, I'm done with it. But if nobody else comes by the end of the week, we can do business. So the end of the week comes and he says, sure, we can do business. Then an hour later, he calls and says, somebody wants to buy it. And that's you know, he's going to look in to see if this person is legit. So he calls the gentleman back and the man says, yes, he has the money. It was at $25,000. It was for $25,000. So that is sold out under us. I was very, very broken. I started to cry and I was like, Lord, that was the closest. And it didn't need any repairs. It was livable. The gentleman was going to help us to get the um, appliances because we needed a stove and a fridge. And he was even going to help us to get a few bits of furnishing, like beds and stuff. Because one of the things I did when I moved from Saskatchewan, because I've moved 14 times since I've lived in Canada. 14 times. And every time I've had to move, I've lost something, broken something, had to get rid of something. So when we moved from Saskatchewan, everything was still in boxes. And even when I moved, I moved from Saskatchewan to Shelburne, Ontario. Then I moved from Shelburne, Ontario to Mount Forest, Ontario, before I finally moved to New Brunswick. And when we moved from Shelburne to Mount Forest, I was able to pack everything in my in two cars and drive it to Mount Forest, which is like 40 minutes away. So I had decided I wasn't going to go back into big furnishings and all of that. We just slept on some foldable um, Ikea bed things and I slept on the ground on pillows and that was it because I was like, the next move will be our more permanent home. When we get there, we'll get furnishings, which we have done since we've been to New Brunswick. So going back to the house that fell through. So I started crying and then I gave myself a little smack in the face and I was like, why are you crying? If God wanted that for you, he would have given that to you. So let's move on. So we moved on. So we see another house around this area. I don't know exactly where it is in the area where I'm at now because I didn't keep the address, but I know it's within this county, as I recall. Even the other one that was sold out from under us is, is within this county because the gentleman had told me about the Adventist church, which I now attend in Perth and Dover. So <clears throat> we see this house and the kitchen is like, oh, gross. It needed to be gutted, but it was within our price range. And I'm like, okay, I'm in it with the hammer. So I called the gentleman down here because at this point I had not been calling him. Because I was like, you know, every time I call the man and then I have to back out because I don't have the money and it's a bit embarrassing. So I called the gentleman, I showed him the house and he looks at it and he's like, because he's into construction. He, he was a contractor when he was younger. He still does that on the side now as he's retired. And he's like, I don't like it, Sharon. Mm -mm, I don't like it. it. It just, one, it's not an, an actual house. It's like a mobile house that they've just added 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 so yeah, the seams on that may be leaking all kinds of stuff on it and then the kitchen is like no the kitchen would need you wouldn't be able to use that kitchen so then this house that we're in now he saw it and 
he called me the next day because I spoke to him late in the night and I was just explaining to him, you know, the financials and everything. And he said, you know, let's just pray, which, is, which was nice. It was nice to have somebody pray for me and with me because I don't really have that many people do that. And we prayed. And after he prayed, we everybody went to bed. He called me the next morning. He said, Sharon, I don't like that house. And I think the real estate agent is pushing you on it too fast. So let's skip that. I saw this one and I like it. At the time, this was like 30, I think it was $39,000. And again, I was like, uh, I don't have that money, 39 grand. I don't have that money. And he's like, remember, you know, you're still at a price, but you can, you know, talk it down. So I said, well, also I had seen this and I called them and the lady had said a few things to me about, you know, like, there was maybe some water in the basement and some whole other stuff. And I was like, I don't understand these things. In Jamaica, we don't get those things. Our houses don't ever flood unless you live in a river. So I was not too keen on something of that nature. So he said, do you want me to call? And I said, sure, I'd really appreciate that. Because, you know, this is your field. You will know. So he called and he was like, oh, and by the way, they're going to reassess it. So it may go down. I'm going to go and look at it on Thursday. It's, an, it's all, a little over an hour from his house to come here. So finally he comes. He looks at it and he says, you know, Sharon, it's a nice little house. It, it's going to need a lot of elbow grease to clean it up. And there are a few little issues, but I, it has good bones. It can work. So he said, you know, when he came, there was another family here who had driven like three hours away to come and look at the property. And these people who had driven three hours away to look at the property didn't have an appointment. So when they came, you know, they were eager to go in. The real estate agent wasn't here as yet. And he said to them, oh, you know, my friend is about, is going to buy the house. So when he said that, the people just left. They just left immediately. So the, 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 first, the first hurdle was gone. The competition to purchase the house was gone. He comes in, he looks at the place, and he basically says, you know, what's the price that's going to buy it? Well, 25000 buy it. And the lady says, you know, just make an offer. Make an offer. Because she was going to be a dual agent now. She was going to be my agent and the bank's agent because it was a repossession. So I put in the offer. She basically says, check to see if you can get insurance. All of these things. Check to see how you can get the electricity change in your name. I do not have an accepted offer as yet. But she, she's talking as if it's mine. That we made the offer on the Thursday. By the Friday, we had the house. Um, the offer not accepted. It, there was a counter offer for 27 now, again, I said I started out with $23,000. God was so faithful that when coronavirus hit, I had lost income because I teach Chinese children online. So I was not able to work because all of China was basically locked down. So I was able to access some money from some government sources, some government help. So that was like $2,000. So that brought me to twenty five. dollars then I decided, you know what, if I'm serious about this, I'm going to ask for some help. So I asked my mom and my two brothers, which that amounted to another, I think, like maybe $4,000. So that brought me up to $30,000, $29,000. Then I, yeah, 30000 because I had some a little savings in the bank. So all of that combined together was what I had in hand. So when it came back to twenty seven thousand dollars you know brother kevin was like it's a good house sharon and it does have that value and if you fix it up you'll get more out of it in the end and i said okay i'm going on your word i'm trusting the lord we prayed about it together oh i mentioned his name i wasn't gonna mention his name but yeah so we prayed about it and we purchased the house now even in the purchasing of the house this is October so we needed the purchase to go through really quickly because winter is coming and as I said the house was a mess it was a mess it was dirty because it had not been nobody had been in here for like over a year 
the people because it was a repossession. They took all that they could take out of it and they left it a mess. So he comes in to, you know, look at it and he says, there is work I need to do. But for him to do the work, he has to get the keys. He can't get the keys until the purchase is complete. Now, normally a purchase can take a month, two months. Within two weeks, we had the keys in hand. He was able to come in here, do a bit of cleaning, do a bit of painting. And this is the end of October. So we decided, you know what? We were going to come down in December. But then I was like, Lord, I don't want to go down there in the winter. And with COVID-19, there was now a restriction as to what you could do. So you had to come and do a 10-day quarantine, which was a whole, you know, change of everything. You wouldn't be able to go here. You would be able to go there. You'd be locked in the house. I say, you know what? It's better to go when there's no snow on the ground and we can see what needs to be done and have a bit more time before the snow hits. So, fine. We come. November 12th, we're able to come down here. We're in quarantine mode for the two weeks. Luckily, our things did not come with us because that's another story. We weren't able to do the process of bringing the stuff with us as I had wanted. I ended up having to get a truck, trucking company to take our stuff down, which worked out perfectly because, as I said, the place was a mess. And it was much easier to clean the house without having everything in it. So I did that. So I cleaned the house. I painted as much as possible and everything. Now the quarantine ends and the excitement begins. Shortly before, when we got here, we had two neighbors come and tell us that our house floods. Like massive flooding. Flooding to the point where the water comes through the basement window. <laughs> so I'm like, Lord, I ask you for country living and everybody wants waterfront, but I don't need water in the house. <laughs> I need it outside. Now, God was so good that even though it had rained, like prior to um, us getting here, it never flooded. So the gentleman who helped us, he would not have seen it. If those people had not come and told us that that basement floods as it did, or as it does, or maybe as it did, it, we would not have known. We would not have known. Because you see the water line, but you you think maybe something burst and it flooded down there because the water line is not that high. And, you know, it must have passed. Because the place is a musty, it isn't moldy, it isn't damp, it isn't, it's nice and dry downstairs. Right? When it's not flooding. So the quarantine ended. And oh, before the quarantine ended, our hot water heater went. And they were saying nobody could come into the house because, you know, we're in quarantine. So again, the gentleman called him and said, listen, hot water is not a privilege. It's the right because we're using well water. And let me tell you, well water is cold. So they came, they fixed it, it broke again, they fixed it, and the fixing was good because we wanted it to be raised off the ground. Because I'm thinking, if it's going to flood, I don't want the water heater sitting in the flood waters because that could damage it. So they were able to come and put it on blocks, and that was good. So going forward now to the quarantine ending, we go to church that weekend. And then the next weekend it rains and it rains and it rains. And I go downstairs to see water. Yes, water. Ankle deep water. And I was like, okay, now what do I do with ankle deep water? Hmm. But I missed something before I even get to the ankle deep water. When we came to the house, there were, as I said, many little repairs that needed to be done because the house had been locked up for a year and the sewer had broken and it was tripping the electricity every time they turn on the light and, you know, somebody flushed the toilet, the thing that runs the sewer, whatever, 
it would trip the light. And I was like, yeah, I don't want that because one, that could be dangerous. So the gentleman who helped us here was able to get some individuals from the Perth and Dover Church to come and help. And one gentleman spent six hours fixing our sore pump. He bought a new pump and he did some other fixing and people went and they fixed the electricity and they rewired the electricity so that the washing machine and dryer that were in the bathroom could go down into the basement. So all of these things were just things that were happening at a cost of zero dollars. Just to mention, when I was moving here, I prayed to the Lord and said, Lord, we got the house, but I was budgeting, you know, looking at the numbers to make the house livable, to make it winterproof, to get some furnishings. We need at least $7,000. And let me tell you, between all the work that the gentleman who helped us did coming here, plus what the, the persons from the church did, amounted to way more than $7,000 way more than seven thousand dollars that was so good in that provision going back to the water issue that was another provision i didn't have any money i was just using my credit card my credit card my credit card so god provided again we needed some pumps to pump the water out because the water was rising it was like rising some members from the church came and the gentleman went he saw what was happening and he was like Okay, we're going to go get some sump pumps for you. I was supposed to pay for the sump pumps. He said, no, no, no. I'll pay for the sump pumps and, you know, let's make a donation to the church. I was so grateful for that. He put the sump pumps in. He bought one sump pump. He realized that the one sump pump that he bought was not moving the water. He bought a second sump pump. The second sump pump together was barely moving the water. Now, as I told you, our neighbor had told us about the situation and he had given me his number because this province is said to be the most friendliest province. That's what um, I'm told. And I can vouch for that. The people here are so helpful. So I called the gentleman. He came over. He saw what was happening. You know, he was very disappointed because, you know, he was sort of upset that we didn't know or weren't made aware of how serious the, the water issue was. And he brought his sump pump, which was a submersible. Now, that was like, you know, the BMW of sump pumps. That thing was pushing out the water like crazy. But because there wasn't like a proper setup for it, you had to be monitoring it. So that night, that first night of that flooding, I did not sleep. I had to be up monitoring the sump pump because... If his sump pump got too dry, the sump pump could actually burn up. So I slept for a few minutes and went back to the sump pump. So it was not pretty. But we got through that first night. It flooded. I think it has flooded like three times. Yeah, that first time and two others. But his, we had his sump pump and it really worked out the situation for us. He made us a promise that if we lasted to the summer, he would help us which is part of the major testimony. So summer came around and, you know, people say a lot of things. I wasn't sure if he was going to fulfill that promise. And you can't really put pressure on people, especially people you don't know. But it came around and he had, he made, he kept that promise. He dug a trench to the side of the house, a little way from the back of the house, around to the side of the house. It took four hours to dig that trench with an excavator we were told by a contractor who came to insulate the roof of the house here when we just came here that that's like over 10 grand to get to get that done okay we're starting with somebody who didn't even have the money to buy the house now to find ten thousand dollars to try and fix the house that yeah that was one of those impossibilities well he came he dug it out we laid some weeping tiles it took four hours to dig it out, and it took three hours to fill it back. Three hours. So seven hours in total of labor. I did not pay for gas. I did not be buying lunch. I did not do anything for this gentleman. Even when we, in the winter time, the man was moving our snow. Honestly, to say more would make this a two-hour testimony. I'm just giving you the abridged version 
with some of the things that has happened. So that was our major, major issue, worrying about the flooding. We have had some heavy rains since he has done that. There hasn't been any flooding, but as the flooding only took place in the winter time, I can't say that it has rectified the issue until this winter will be the true test. And I'm just trusting the Lord that that has been done. This property was a one acre property. We're not as remote as I'd like to be. We're right at the corner of the road. But I wanted to say that sometimes you have to start where you are. If God had put me in some remote, dark corner by myself with two small children, it would have been overwhelming. I would have broken down, I would have cried. As much as I know that he's my strength, I would have fallen over flat. But he placed us where we could get, um, I wouldn't say a mother come, where we could get help for somebody starting out. Snow removal, my oil change for free, advice, um, help again with the, the water situation downstairs. You know, all of these things matter. All of these things, especially for a single person. This video is geared more for the single moms. I remember 2019, after coming from Madoc, I was SDA Country Living, I think, is the Facebook page that I'm on. And this lady, who's also single with two children, was told by a gentleman on the page that she can't do it because her children need a man in their life and they will be screwed up for life, basically. And it wasn't meant to be that way. Yes, it wasn't meant to be that way. But if it's that way, then you claim the promise of um, Isaiah 54, 5 to 6, where God is your husband. And then you're also not limiting God to think that only God can only be able if you're in the perfect nuclear home. Right? So when we came here, God provided husbands for me in that men were coming to help me to do things right advice was being given aid was being offered if even the individual that fixed our sore we went to church the following week to find out that he was actually the pastor of the church and since then he has come here and helped us to do to fix my washing machine broke he fixed it the bathroom toilet needed fixing he fixed it some other pipes, because when the house is locked up, and the water isn't running through the pipes, the pipes get messed up. He fixed them. And God has helped us in that way. So to the single mother who is out there who is saying, I can't do this, I can't do this, be encouraged. You don't have to do it. God will do it for you. Um, a lot, the last part of the testimony that I'll share is that there was an adjoining property. So we were basically looking at this broken down house outside. And the broken down house, not attractive. The people in the neighborhood wants to hit it down, like, you know, like today. But there was always a concern that we'd get somebody right beside us. Even though we have neighbors, we can only see our neighbors through the trees. The only time we see people really is because we're in front of the, um, the post box. So we'll see people when they come to get their mail and everybody waves, you know, and then they go. But... We didn't want somebody to live right beside us because if somebody lives right beside us, they literally they, we share a driveway. That property shares a driveway because this house was the other property owner divided and sold a friend an acre and they built the house here. So you would see them in their attire, you would hear their music, their conversations, and I didn't want that. Now when it when we first came here, they said that it would have gone up for sale in because it was owned by the government because it was a repossession as well for back taxes. And they said that they would have put it up for sale in December. And I didn't have any money in December. They said it would go up in January. I didn't have any money in January. April, we came home to see the sign on the wall saying that... Um, saying that the property is now up for auction and I got a notice in the mail because I'm the property closest to it so that I was aware and I was like Lord 
the price was, you know, above us. It was over $5,000. And I was like, Lord, I don't have that money. We happened to get my tax refund, which was $3,000, $3,700. I paid my tithe, gave my offering, and then I said, okay, I'm going to use that to pay off the smaller line of credit, which I did. So I was like, yes, I paid off a line of credit. I only had the other two to pay now. And I was very happy. And then as when it came up, I was saying, you know, I was speaking to the gentleman who helped us to come down here. And I was like, oh, we have finally put it up. And this is the price. And, you know, I don't have the money. So I, I don't know. So he was saying, make an offer for it. I'll lend you the money. I really don't know this gentleman from Adams. We have only conversed over the phone since 2019. And then since we have been here, he has been back and forth helping us to do things. Honestly, if I were to put a dollar figure on what that gentleman has done for us, it's over $50,000 worth of work or even more. He helped us to get all of our appliances, all of the furniture that we have in here. He's the one who got it for us. He helped me to build a bunk bed for the boys. He has been a wealth of information, you know, even information on gardening, on the area, stuff like that. He has just been such a help to us. The boys love him like crazy. They like to be around him. He's an older gentleman, I guess. He's like a grandfather that they never had, right? So he said, you know, go for it. I think you'll get it. <laughs> So we went for it and by God's grace, we did get it. So now we have six acres of land plus the house. The house is valued by the, by the province at over $70,000. But with the land now and based on everything that's happening, if we were to try to sell, which only if God says to sell, we're going to do that. That's like over $100,000. I'm told that we could possibly get for it. But the point is simply this, that God provided, God provided, even the old house that was over there it needed to be demolished. And I was thinking, okay, now we have the house, but how do we get rid of it? The excavator was here, dug the hole in it, pushed down the house and dumped it in. And now we have that nice open space. You're not looking at this eyesore, the, the yard over there had not been cut like for years so that grass was matted i tried cutting it with the lawnmower that i had the lawnmower was smoking <laughs> so another neighbor had introduced himself the friday before so i called him because he has a ride on and that man gave us a nice open area cut and looking beautiful and we were so grateful and we are still very grateful so that is my testimony in short. There are so many things in between that I could share. But I don't want this to be too long. <clears throat> Before I go to the last three verses, I wanted to give some practical tips. When we were moving here, we were praying for a country home. In September, I stopped praying for a country home. And I started praying for a country spirit. I started praying to God that I would have the country spirit. What did I mean by that? Now, the gentleman who helped us with the sun pump and helped us with the excavator, every morning I see him about sometimes six in the morning in the winter time driving down. He comes back. He drives again past the house around 4.30 in the evening, comes back. Whether it is raining, whether it is snowing, whether it is freezing cold, he goes to his little farm down the road to look after his horses and his cows and whatever things he has to do down there. So the country spirit is basically the spirit of being willing to do what I need to do when I need to do it. I've been here. When I first came here, I stayed up late one night painting. And the next morning, I was in intense pain. My hand had swollen to twice its size and I realized that I was, I am or possibly developing some form of arthritis in my hand because since then it has come on and off 
and there are times when I'll get really stiffness in my fingers in the morning. And I still had to do the work because it was just the three of us and I had to do it. There have been mornings and days when the bug population here is wicked. It's a lot. And I have to go outside in a bug, bug vest with my mesh on my head. And they're still finding their way in and through that to get to me. If I, this mark here is a bite in the face. I have several around my neck, even my waist, because they go under the mesh and go under my shirt. You know, even though it's a long shirt and sweater, sometimes these things are crazy. Yet I have to go outside and I have to do it. Okay, whatever it is that has to be done, has to be done. But more importantly, it has to be done with the right attitude. And I'm good at doing, but not necessarily good at doing it with the right attitude. I'm good at murmuring and complaining, forgetting Philippians 2, where we should not murmur or dispute, do all things to the honor and glory of God. So I was praying for the country spirit. And that is what... We need to pray for. That is what we need to have. What are the things that I've learned since I've been here? Well, one, when you come to the country, you need a whole different, um, you know, different appliances, different appendages. Before you just had a stove and a fridge and your washing machine ain't dry. You need your lawnmower. You need your wheelbarrow. You need your tools of the trade, your hoe, your um, machete, your axe, your hatchet. You need all of these things. So you have to be prepared to get these implements and learn how to use them and try to use them. You need <clears throat> knowledge. So all of these things I'm mentioning are for those who are not yet in the country and who are looking to go into the country. These are things you can acquire little by little. You need your hose. You need your watering devices. These are the things you can acquire while you're there. Buy them when you see them on sale. In addition, you also need to ensure that you have knowledge, you have wisdom. You know, pray for that. Pray for God to send the right people to give you direction. Trust that God will send you the help. Another verse I should have added was the verse where he says he'll put you in families. Since I've been here, when we were in Mount Forest, when we were in Shelburne, we never had anybody that we really socialized with. The people there, even though we went to the church, we never went to their home. The kids never really got to engage with anybody from the church. They only saw them on Sabbath and that was it. Everybody was, you know, in their own little world. But when we came here, when we came here, God was able to bless them with spiritually minded people that they can associate with, they can spend time with. Every um, Wednesday or Thursday, we go to a family's home who are, you know, like minded. I get spiritual encouragement as a mother, they get spiritual encouragement as children. The conversation is along the line that I appreciate. The activities are along the line that are stimulating. So God provided that for them. And God can provide that for you. Because, you know, there is still that social need that needs to be met, especially for them. So God provided that. So you can trust the Lord for that. In addition to those things, you need to be examining yourself. What I've learned while I've been here is that as a parent, I'm not as available. I'll cook, I'll clean, I'll read to you, I'll do this. But I'm, I'm not from a society where we hug and we cuddle and we kiss kids and we say I love you very often. For me anyways, it was a rare occurrence. And even I never really saw that with my friend's family. But since I've been here and I've been observing the other families around me, I see that. I see that closeness. I see that oneness. I see that hugging, that kissing, that loving and that's what God calls us to do, to, to love and to kiss and to, you know, to be those people. And he just has to take advantage of that. Yeah. So, so yes. So those are my 
that is my testimony. That is our testimony. That is what little I have to share with you. I just wanted to end with three verses. I hope whatever was said was in some way a blessing to somebody, some way an encouragement to someone. So Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. <clears throat> I know it, but I like to just read it so that I don't miss a word. So it says, let's get to it. Proverbs 3, 5 to 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. It's always easy to think we know what is right and what is the perfect place. And not only that, we often look to other people to tell us what is right and what is the perfect place. Let God tell him, if, if we had found out about the flooding downstairs prior to coming here, we would not have come here. Yet, I have learned more about myself being here than I did when I was in any other place. I have grown in my ability to tolerate certain things more. There is still a lot of growth necessary, so much heart searching that needs to be done and heart cleansing and confession that needs to be done. But if we had known what we know now, I know we would not have come here and I would have missed out on that experience. My next verse is one that I think is so, so important. And this is what goes with what I just said about the heart cleansing. It says, Luke eleven thirteen. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? We need the Holy Spirit. People, we need the Holy Spirit. We need to have that experience where we are convicted of our sins and confirmed in our forgiveness of those sins and that God loves us. Which goes to the next verse that I have, which is James 4, 8 to 9. For many of us, we don't believe that God can do it for us because we think that we have done so much that God is unwilling to bless us. <clears throat> and that is not true. He says to us that we should James that we should come as we are. So he sorry not Hebrews, James four eight to nine says Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. And I'll add verse 10 to this. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. Allow the Lord to take you down to that level where you give up every single thing. I cannot say that my walk here has been perfect. My prayer now is Psalms 101 where um, David asked the Lord to help him to walk with a perfect heart in his house. I've had moments where I've been not where I want to be mentally. But God has helped me tremendously and he continues to help me. He has provided the physical and now I have come to realize that he wants me to focus more on the spiritual. There are still debts that are owed. There are still things that need to be done. But he didn't bring us here to be consumed with any of those things. He brought us here to be consumed by the Holy Spirit. Every time I see a hummingbird fly by, which was such a wonderful experience, my first experience with a hummingbird here was standing on our deck and one stopped right in front of me for a good minute, just beating its wings and you know, just hovering right there. And I was like, whoa, now that is beautiful. It had a nice red crest on its breast. It was so beautiful. And these are the things that remind me that God is so good. I just want to end with one short story that no matter where or what state you think you are, you're not dead. You're still very much alive to God. And he very much wants to put as he says, the quickening in you. 
we bought some fig trees and one day I went and I looked at the trees. One still had some leaves and the other one, all the leaves had fallen off. I was very distraught. I was like, oh no, my fig tree is dead. So I dug it out and I went and I bought a bush because I was like, a berry bush may grow better than the fig tree. So I dug it out of the hole and threw it on the side of the hill. After three days, I said, you know what? Maybe it's not dead. Something just said to me, maybe it's not dead. So I went and I took it up and I put it in a pot with some soil and I watered it and put a little amendments on it. And a few days later, I noticed that a little, you know, little green thing was just coming on the side there. And now the thing has four, I think, four leaves. Four, a big leaf and three little baby leaves. And I was like, wow, I threw you out as dead. Yet you still had life. God can do so much for us. God can make where there was, there seemed to be no way, he can make a way. That's a song that Timmy likes. He can make a way. So again, I'm just going to pray to end and I hope that you are encouraged. So we'll just pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, dear God, I hope I did not say anything that displeased you. I hope that everyone who listens will actually feel empowered, encouraged, more decisive as it relates to moving into the country and trusting for your provisions. Father, I really hope that we will all seek more after your spirit. You promised there, Lord, that you are willing to give that spirit to us. You're willing to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Creating us a clean heart, oh God, and your right spirit. Bless our families, bless our children, bless those who are still, you know, hemming and hawing as to what to do. May we truly be committed to serving you. As we see the things happening around us, may we be happy knowing that it is a witness to the nearness of your coming. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Amen.